Hello and welcome back to the course on dealing with materials data. We have come a long way. We had a six week of uh, course on basic understanding, basic understanding of basic concepts of statistics. Uh, in this session, we are going to summarize whatever we have learned so far. So, summing up, our journey began by telling the story about data, how to explain a data to someone who has not seen the data or data is so large that can't make out of anything about it quickly. So, we what we called it data description or descriptive statistics. Then we started learning about chance and we defined the chance dependent events and their sample space. And then we came to the measure of chance as a probability with three postulates which said that uh, probability of event any event lies between 0 and 1. The probability of a whole space is 1 and if you have mutually exclusive events then the sum of uh, the union of probability of union of the event is sum of the individual probabilities. And then we said that there are some sample spaces which are discrete which tend to take discrete values and there are some sample spaces which are continuous because they tend to take continuous values. Then we introduced what is called randomness and here friends I would like to tell you that after taking this course we should be able to distinguish between a randomly occurring event and an arbitrary event. You see it is a very common habit to say that you know some random person came or some random thing happened. Sometimes we actually mean arbitrary. So, let me take little bit of time to tell you the random variable the way we have defined and that is why I call it a introduction to randomness. The random variable is always connected with a probability. It is a sample space with a probability mapped to a real number. So, it is a number but it is has a probability attached to it. While when you talk of arbitrary, arbitrariness has nothing to do with probability. So, there is a distinction between the two. So, at least one takeaway from this course is definitely that you know when to use a random word and when to use a word arbitrary. How to define an event to be random and how when you say that it is arbitrary. Then we talk what are the expectations of this uh, random variables, what is the uncertainty by that what I mean is that what is the variance because variance defines that it varies between these limits with certain probability as we have studied in the uh, interval estimation. So, the variance as a takeaway you can understand it that it is a measure of uncertainty of the random variable. Then we understood certain inequalities. Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality and weak law of large number. Here what we have tried to say is we have to try to put a bound on the probability of population member lying within a certain limits. So, for example, Markov inequality says that if a you know a, a random variable x is always positive then probability that the x takes a value larger than a predefined uh, value predefined number a, it is smaller than expected value of x divided by a. Chebyshev's inequality says that the values that would lie between pl mu plus k and mu minus k interval of a random variable x that is random variable x would lie between mu minus k and mu plus k where mu is its mean value and k is any real number greater than 0 then that is less than or equal to the variance of the random variable divided by k square. The weak law of large number finally says that the sample mean comes very close to the actual mean of the population as the number of sample size gets larger and larger. This is called weak law of large number. Then we started learning about population through samples. 
So, we said ok first let us see what all kinds of different distribution forms that a population can take. So, we learned about some special random variables Bernoulli trials, binomial distributions, geometric distribution, normal distribution, negative binomial distribution, chi-square distribution, f distribution and so on and so forth. And in this we came to a central limit theorem which said that for a very large value of n that is your large value of a large sample size, the sample mean minus the population uh, mean divided by its uh, population variance by square root n behaves like a normal random variable with mean 0 and variance 1. This only helps in case of a large sample size you know that the behavior of mean is like a normal random variable and it is close its expected value is expected to be the mean of the population. Then we said that suppose you have made this assumption on the population and your sample has certain values of its uh, probability density function or probability distribution function then we talked about probability plots. How to plot the hypothetical value that is what you have assumed value of the population along with that is assumed uh, cumulative distribution function along with the sample uh, cumulative distribution function and make a judgment whether it is your assumption is true or close to the reality or not. Then we came to parameter and their estimations we learned about maximum likelihood estimator, we learned about uh, the estimator that is uh, method of moments estimator. We also showed that there could be inconsistency if you use method of moment estimators. The evaluation of parameter uh, estimation also we learned we said that there could be you know you can take a least squares uh, distance uh, minimum bias distance and then if there is if there is no bias then you call it an unbiased estimator. And we also introduced very briefly the Bayesian estimation we did not really introduce Bayesian estimators per se, but we gave the conceptual design of how the Bayesian estimators are derived. We moved forward uh, and we started working on hypothesis testing. Now here I would like to tell you that yes, we did all the work by looking at or making an assumption that the population is normal. So you might be wondering that if the population is all the time normal then what is the point because it was already said that uh, the materials data tend to be skewed they are not beautifully bell shaped curve then what is the point of having it. But I would like to bring it to your notice that the concept of critical region, the concept of type 1 and type 2 errors and the approach to keep the type 1 error as small as possible by predefining a value alpha. This concept has nothing to do with uh, any distributional assumption. These are very general <coughs> assumptions that have been made. So, these are, these are the assumptions uh, for any distribution. There is no assumption, there is no need to have a normal distribution assumption here. Also with respect to testing the mean equal to a given value or uh, equality of two different means or uh, when the means are equal when variance are unknown to say that a variance is equal to a given value. You take a, any of this test which will be a z test a t test or chi square test. If you wish to have a look at the table and arrive at an alpha value or to arrive at a cutoff value then you need a normal distribution assumption. Otherwise frankly speaking two sided test says that z t or chi square 
neither should be too small nor it should be too large. The value you can always calculate the t or chi square and you just have to see that it should not be very 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 large and it, it neither should be very very small if you are looking at two sided test. If you are looking at one sided test and depends on which side you are looking into it should not be very small or it should not be very large. And this we demonstrated by arriving at chi, uh, Weibull t and Weibull chi square test. So, here I would like to tell you that the real takeaway for you is to understand that this statistics the z statistic t statistic chi square statistic and in future in ANOVA what comes as an f statistic their value comparatively is large or small is all you are looking at. If you wish to have a, a what we call a, a cutoff value then as we have shown in the case of Weibull distribution, you can always do it by doing the simulation. Now the computer is in your hands, the algorithm is there, you can simulate the random numbers and generate the cutoff values that you wish for any given alpha value that you need to have. So the takeaway here is please do not get take, you know carried away by the normality assumption, the takeaway is that these statistics which have been introduced here with the reference to the test uh, uh, the hypothesis made are valid even beyond the normal distribution. Then we started going into applications, we first considered regression application, we again looked into the coefficient estimation and then we did the hypothesis testing for regression coefficient, mean regression and future response. Again please remember in all this we have derived t statistic and t statistic is a t statistic, it need not have the normal assumption, it is a unitless statistic and can be looked into it with reference to any distribution that you wish to assume or you can uh, do it. Uh, you know by simulating it and getting the cutoff values if you are so keen to look into it otherwise looking at the largeness and smallness is good enough to give you an answer. Then we talked about coefficient of determination to decide how good is the fit. We talked about residual analysis very important. We have made some assumptions and this assumptions we must verify through the residual analysis. We also talked briefly about the transformations that can lead again back to regression, linear regression and uh, I know that in the sessions doing your analysis with data analysis with R, you have been given variety of examples other than the what we discussed in the our regular statistics class for this kind of a uh, transformation leading to a linear regression model. We very briefly talked about logistic regression. Then we started going through the case study and understanding analysis of variance. We studied the analysis of variance, again we came across the F ratio because we realized that analysis of variance as it says it is comparing the two variances which arise under the hypothesis and due to the error. And if you compare the two uh, 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 estimate of variances, it leads to an F ratio and larger the F ratio, more chances that you are deviating from your assumption of uh, the rows or the all the laboratories in our case of case study, all the laboratories are not different or the, all the laboratories are same. So, you are deviating from it. Once again, F distribution is not important, F ratio is important. We extended it to a two way analysis of variance and now you can all imagine that you can further extend it even to the three way analysis of variance and so on and so forth depending on the problem. Finally, we came to design of experiments. This we understood completely through case study. 
There is one important point which I had forgotten to mention which I would like to mention it here that when we chose the design matrix of size 16, please remember had we not done this exercise since we had 7 independent random variables varying that is independent variables varying were 7 the size of the uh, design matrix would have been 2 to the power 7 instead we worked out with 2 to the power 4. So, this is also called a fractional factorial uh, experiment the, this is confounded experiment I totally agree. Uh, but these details as I said are the details when you go into more and more understanding and detailed or very intricate designed experiments. But to begin with because this says that dealing with materials data to begin with when you want to do the de design of experiment this case study gives you an idea that instead of having experiments number 2 of the power 2 to the power 7 we are dealing with only 2 to the power 4 and that makes the difference. Once again there are some important takeaways here which I had mentioned there. Design of experiment is never the designed experiment is never the first set of experiments. You have to have some preliminary experiments done before in order to understand what are the factors affecting what are the interactions that might be affecting, how the levels are playing a role. Levels should signify the relationship between factor and the response. It should not be taken out of just curiosity. Yes, in scientific experimentation curiosity plays a major role. But in design of experiment the purpose is to have a systematic experiment as small number as possible and gain maximum out of it. So, minimum number of experimentation maximum gain requires that this level should truly signify the relationship between the factor and the response. Some preliminary analysis or preliminary experimentation is very necessary for that. The size of the experiment should be decided only once these exercises are over. And please do not forget to randomize and replicate the estimation because randomization and replication takes away two other kinds of errors. The randomization takes care of the nuisance factor, the errors uh, or the, rand, uh, the random error occurring through the nuisance factor and replication takes care of the random error occurring through the ex because of the experimentation itself. There are some common mistake I have seen when the you know young uh, researcher comes to me to take a help on design of experiment. They try to analyze response after every single experiment. Please remember we design a design matrix, we did not design a single experiment, we designed a matrix. So, the complete matrix of the uh, experiment should be completed before that let us not get into the analysis it actually diverts our attention from the experimentation. Second thing I have found is that without putting so much of thought as to what should be the uh, levels, why should be 3 levels or 2 level experiment, how many replications you wish to make, what interactions are important. Simply arbitrarily, now I am not saying randomly, I am saying arbitrarily a design is chosen, an experiment is done. And when you come with such an experiment already over and your analysis is not very informative to you, well I have to remember R. A. Fisher who used to say that if you approach a statistician after the experimentation is over, perhaps all the statistician can do is do the post mortem to find out what the experiment died of. So, let us not make that mistake. So, these are the major important takeaways and why am I spending time here? Actually speaking this whole course was to make you understand regression, analysis of variance and design of experiment. 
as we saw in design of experiment it uses the, the principles of regression, it also uses the principles of analysis of variance. So, that is how it is in that order. But in order to understand the design of experiment, the analysis of variance and the regression, we had to understand the basic of statistics. So, these techniques which a materials engineer would be using more frequently which is regression or analysis of variance of design of experiment, please remember Please understand your uh, basics clearly, what are you doing and then apply it and uh, these are the your major uh, takeaways from the design of experiment. I wish the journey continues and may the journey continue forever. You learn more about statistics, you learn more about uh, materials data analysis. This is the age for material data science and I wish you all the very best. Thank you.